Thank you to Politics in the Pub for um, inviting me to speak about this very important topic. Uh, I also want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land. Uh, this is Aboriginal land, uh, always was, always will be, a land that was never ceded. I think that's only uh, pertinent in the context of discussing foreign intervention into another country to, to, raise this in, in, to begin by raising this important issue. What I hope to do in my talk, my presentation today, um, is address two aspects of what the topic of tonight's forum is, essentially this question of US intervention in Venezuela. The first half I want to dedicate to the question of well, what do we mean by US intervention in, in Venezuela, if that even is occurring. Jim says there's no doubt, but then if you read the newspaper, um, most of them imply that at best there's minimal support in the background, uh, and in other cases, They're just out, out, outright. Uh, yeah, so otherwise it's just a, a pure, a pure you know, Trump has all of a sudden, despite it, everything else that he's done, has all of a sudden found a good bone in his body and he's just there in Venezuela to, to spread democracy. Um, so I want to really outline a, a, just a, a real timeline of what has occurred in Venezuela because this doesn't get reported in the media to sort of focus then on if, if we understand what's occurring in Venezuela today. How should progressive-minded people respond to many of the other more uh, deeper questions that are raised by the situation in Venezuela? And questions about uh, Maduro's, uh, the Venezuelan president, uh, Nicolas Maduro's legitimacy, uh, his democratic credentials or otherwise, and what sort of solidarity actions um, should we be advocating uh, here in Australia? But that, that can only flow from an understanding of what is occurring right now in Venezuela. Now, if you pick up almost any newspaper in the world, Google Venezuela News, what you'll get is just a very simple and basic explanation of what is occurring or what has occurred in the last month in Venezuela. And that explanation is essentially can be summarized as, one, the overwhelming majority of our population fed up by an economic slash humanitarian crisis that has risen up. Two, they have rejected a president that they see as illegitimate because they sold, stole fraudulent elections. Three, that the National Assembly is the last remaining democratic institution in Venezuela and given its role as the last remaining democratic institution, has stepped in to fill a void left by the illegitimate presidency of Nicolas Maduro. And five, in, represent, in representation of the people's will, uh, Juan Guaido has assumed the interim presidency in line with Article 233 of the Constitution. This is basically the five points of, that almost every article in the media will just explain. That this is fundamentally people rising up, that the National Assembly as the last remaining elected body in Venezuela, assuming the will of the people, has stepped in to represent this in a democratic fashion and in line with the Constitution. And given all this, the international community has simply come back and supported this move. So, is this really just democracy in action? Perhaps with a bit of US backing, perhaps not. Or are we seeing a US coup? And when I say US coup, I don't mean a US backed coup, but a US led coup in Venezuela. Mm. Well, I think it's absolutely clear, in fact, that what we're seeing is a parallel government and a push to set up a parallel government that has come directly from the United States. Why? Of course, the simple answer is to say, well, everything that happens when it comes to coups in Latin America has the US behind it. Um, it could also be the easier, the second other easy answer would be to say, well, the last 20 years of Venezuelan politics has been constant US conspiracy to overthrow first Hugo Chavez and then Nicolas Maduro. But those are in and of itself are not enough to really explain what's occurring today. I think we can, though, without a doubt, say that what we are seeing is a US-led coup. Why? Because everyone involved says so. Um, mm -hmm. even if the media doesn't want to report this. So let's go through the events that have occurred. On January 5, the National Assembly reconvened for the start of the year and elected a new uh, presidency of the National Assembly. As part of that election, which is a ro based on a rotational basis of the opposition parties, um, Juan Guaido was selected by the National Assembly to become the president of the National Could Assembly. Could you repeat that date? January 5. Thank you. Um, so, and to explain the significance of that is that was five days before uh, Nicolas Maduro was met with the, the new president, which was Nicolas Maduro as he'd been elected in the previous uh, elections, was to assume the presidency. So, in this January 5 meeting, the National Assembly meets 
They say they don't recognize the legitimacy of Maduro. They elect Juan Guaido as the president of the National Assembly, but leave it at that. At no point is there any mention of assuming an interim presidency. On January 10, sorry, on January 10, Nicolas Maduro, as the person elected in the previous elections that were held in May 20, assumes the presidency. On January 15, the National Assembly meets again. They reaffirm their rejection of Maduro as the president. They point to Article 233, which raises the question of what can happen in the context of a vacancy of the presidency, but do not announce Juan Guaido as the interim president. Instead, they raise the talk of the need to form a transitional government, and they see this as a future prospect. In this vote in the National Assembly, the most radical right-wing parties in the National Assembly abstain from the vote. Why do they abstain? Because they say that the vote doesn't go far enough, that Juan Guaido on that day should have assumed the interim presidency, supposedly in line with the Constitution. But the three main opposition parties in the National Assembly, who are, remember, we're told that the National Assembly is the one that's leading all this in representation of, of the people. The three main opposition parties, UNT, A New Time, AD, Acción Democrática or Democratic Action, and PJ, Justice First, all of which form the majority bloc of the opposition in Parliament, all explain that they, while they reject Maduro as the president, they are not willing to go as far as declare the presidency vacant and to, and to call in an interim president. And they explain their reasoning very clearly in, in, in declarations that are available in Spanish, but not in the English media, of why they do this. Firstly, because they want to follow the Constitution. So they firstly recognise that attempting to call an interim president at that time would not be following the Constitution. Two, because they want to continue to pursue the electoral road and believe that the way out of the crisis in Venezuela is for new elections to be convened and for a new president to arise out of those elections. Um, and three, because they also recognise the risk of proposing something that is unobtainable and want to avoid another possible frustration by raising false expectations because we must remember for the last 20 years and certainly for the last five years under Maduro almost every week the opposition has been telling their support base that Maduro is going to go, Maduro is going to go, Maduro is going to go and yet Maduro is still there as, as president. So they wanted to avoid once again calling, d declaring that tomorrow was the, end, was the end of Maduro. Instead they make it very clear what they want to do. They want to continue to focus within Venezuela and internationally to declare Maduro as an illegitimate president and, get, and push for international pressure for what they call clean, fair, free elections uh, in the sense of claiming that the May 20 elections were not that. And during these days, a delegation from the European Union meet with the National Assembly to discuss exactly that plan, how to work towards a transition towards new elections. All of this is based on a fundamental recognition of the main opposition parties that A, they lack the constitutional backing to do what they are attempting to do now. Two, that all of it would be fake because they do not have the backing of the military. So uh, no government has ever existed in the world without a, without a military force to back it. And three, they're not convinced that they have the popular support to convert the situation of being a supposed interim president into, into a reality. Instead, as I said, they continue to propose the road of elections. All of this of what I'm saying is confirmed by the probably or arguably the most important leader of the opposition, Enrique Capriles, who in an interview in January 30, so now we're talking a week after Juan Guaido has declared himself to be interim president, states very specifically in this interview, firstly that no one supported this move and secondly that all of the main opposition leaders were taken by surprise when Juan Guaido on January 23 declared himself to be interim president. So what changed? We know that if we look at the basic statements of all of the key opposition leaders, both before and after January 23, when Juan Guaido declares himself to be the interim president, we understand that none of them knew that this was happening, none of them supported this was happening. There must have been something that changed for why Juan Guaido on January 23 would declare himself as interim president. Well, again, what do we know? We just have to listen to what the people have told us. On January 22, a series of meetings occurred in Washington involving U.S. President Donald Trump, U.S. Vice President Mike Pence, uh, Florida Senator and arch-right-wing 
uh, right winger Marco Rubio, and Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo, and National Security Advisor um, John Bolton, all to discuss the situation in Venezuela. On January 22, we also know because it's on the record and it's in report in the media that jo that Mike Pence phoned Juan Guaido and said that he was willing to support Guaido if he came out the next day to declare himself as interim president. <laughs> now, this is a funny thing because the media reports this as support him if he makes this declaration, but as I've noted, everyone in the opposition up until that day was saying they don't want to do this. So I think the idea that he just said we'll support you is obviously a much more clearer declaration to Guaido to say, look, do this and trust us, we will, we will back you 100% on mm -hmm. this. On January 22, Marco Rubio, as I said, the Florida Senator tweeted, tomorrow will be a big day for democracy in Venezuela. So on the very same day that Venezuelan yeah, opposition right. leaders are saying we are not going to do Miami. this, from Miami, in Florida, Marco Rubio is tweeting, tomorrow will be a big day for democracy. What else do we know? What else is on public record? The Spanish Foreign Minister has stated that the Spanish government got a call on January 20, on the morning of January 23, to be prepared for important events in Venezuela, but that they could not tell him what was about to occur. We also know that immediately after Juan Guaido made his announcement, they got another call demanding that the Spanish government immediately come out and recognise the Juan Guaido interim presidency. So while no one in Venezuela even knew about or even supported the declaration of a so-called interim presidency, outside the coup was already underway, as we, as we know. As I said, and these are just statements that are made on public record, and we, when the declassified information comes out, we'll get a lot more info, but this is what we can already gather. This also fits in more broadly with what's been occurring in Venezuela since, since about mid-2017, where the shift in the front line of the battle for Venezuela's future has largely shifted to outside of Venezuela itself. 2017 was a crucial turning point for a number of reasons. Firstly, internally in Venezuela, the opposition almost largely came to an understanding that they were unable to physically impose the outcome that they wanted. If people remember, in 2017, on, um, in April, uh, a series of uh, violent opposition protests began, protests that would last until the end of July, um, so essentially four months of sustained protest, all with the demand for Maduro out. The end result of that, rather than Maduro out, was an election to a National Constituent Assembly, um, which was, depending on how you want to characterise it, anything from a parallel National Assembly to the existing National Assembly to a, a body convened to discuss the, uh, and debate the future of Venezuela and come up with a reformed constitution as a part of a dialogue to come out of the crisis. This was the end result of the, this violent push to overthrow uh, Maduro. Having, having seen no fracture in the military, having seen no fracture in the support for the Maduro government, outside of Venezuela it became clear that the only way they could change the situation inside Venezuela was by building pressure from outside. <coughs> and they were helped by a number of factors that contributed to, to why, we, why we can see what is occurring in Venezuela today. Some of the factors to consider, the changes within the Trump administration, We've seen over the last year the removal or the resignation of certain figures such as Rex Tillerson, McMasters, uh, Mattis, all people that were generally associated with the old sort of traditional guard of, of, of US foreign policy, the moderates. Many, many of whom were viewed as the moderates, many of whom who questioned Trump over his withdrawal of troops over in Syria and Afghanistan and their replacement with basically a whole bunch of hawks, such as Mike Pompeo, the former head of the CIA, and John Bolton, who people may rec remember him from things like the Iraq War. Um, <laughs> we've also seen the change of forces, of correlation of forces in the region itself. And whilst that could be a talk in and of itself, I think it's very important to recognise that we would not be discussing what is occurring today in Venezuela had it not been for the fact that in the neighbouring country of Brazil, we did not have a president, Dilma Rousseff, from the Workers' Party, unconstitutionally removed by the parliament, and the most favoured candidate in the polls, again from the Workers' Party, Lula da Silva, jailed so that he could not run in the elections, all of which paved the way to a clear fascist, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, to take the reins in Brazil. Uh, if today Dilma hadn't have been removed and if Lula hadn't have been jailed, would almost certainly have a Workers' Party government in Brazil and this would be a, a massive barrier to any US pretensions to, to removing, um, removing Maduro and 
what's behind that, which is really destroy the Bolivarian process that's been occurring in Venezuela. But this, along with other changes of government in the region, have also benefited the correlation of forces <coughs> regionally and internationally to help promote what, is, what has occurred. And so that's why we get what we get in statements such as the ones made by US officials to the Washington Post, that they were very clear. The US policy was build international pressure, organize the opposition, push for democratic peaceful democratic transition in Venezuela, but that what was constantly lacking in all this time was the internal peace in their puzzle. What was that internal peace? Who became that internal peace? Juan Guaido. Juan Guaido, who by casualty, by, sorry, by coincidence, became the National Assembly President, who then was agreed to follow the US plan of declaring himself interim president and in which immediately the US began to full swing campaign to get international recognition for him as interim president, use him as a justification to implement harsh sanctions that the US would not have been able to do without the pretext of the Juan Guaido government, such as the ones that are occurring with PDVSA and its affiliates in the US CITGO, where essentially the US government has stolen Venezuelan state assets under the pretext of saying we're protecting them for the Venezuelan people and we'll be depositing the money into accounts for the Juan Guaido, for the future mm -hmm. Juan Guaido um, government. Uh, all of this in the, must be remembered when we hear in the media about the $20 million um, that they're offering in, in, as a one-off humanitarian aid, uh, which is equivalent of about three days of what these sanctions are impacting on the Venezuelan economy um, every, as I said, every three days. So that's, that would be my first point. There is no doubt that what is occurring today is not just US intervention, but is, is driven by the US, is pushed by the US. It's not even a strategy that the majority opposition themselves initially supported, but of course, given once, once the ball got rolling, realized they had to get behind it in order to ensure to, or to see where, as far as this could go. So what does this mean then about the other questions that then come up? Because of course we can all say that, but then the criticism comes up. Oh, but what are you saying? There's no valid protests against Maduro. Are you saying Maduro isn't a dictator? Are you saying that it's not, you know, Maduro is not to blame, that there's not a big crisis in Venezuela? Well, let's go for at least some of these points. Obviously it's impossible to go for all of them, and if people have questions afterwards, we can deal with them then. But I want to deal with at least two, two of the important ones. The first one is, well, what about the protests in Venezuela? Are you saying there are not legitimate protests in Venezuela, given the current very deep and serious economic crisis that is occurring um, in that country? Yeah. Are we just saying that they're all just CIA agents, just because they're all coming out in protest in the context of a US coup? Well, of course not. But then again, neither were those that were involved in the protests against Salvador Allende in 1973 mm -hmm. prior to his overthrow. Not all of them were also on the CIA payroll. This is a, a silly, a silly d discussion point that tries to remove us from the reality of what is occurring in Venezuela today. And the reality of, in, of, the reality of in Venezuela today and the protests that are occurring is, is three things that need to be taken into consideration. Sorry, at least three things that need to be taken into consideration. One. The protests are not the driving force of what is occurring today in Venezuela. Neither before, as I've outlined, um, and, and neither subsequent to Juan Guaido declaring himself as the interim president. It's very interesting to compare two things, or to look at two things of the protests that have occurred since January 23. The first is the very small amount of protests that have occurred. As I mentioned, in 2017, there was four months of almost daily protests to overthrow Maduro. Since January, 20, since January 23, we've seen three protests organised by the opposition of a reasonable size, but by far not their largest protests that they've, that they've organised. But of course, the, 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 this idea of having at least a few protests every couple of weeks continues to give the image that it's the, pro, the democratic protesters that are, that are leading the way and it continues to give the coverage that the media want to do to say that it is all coming from, from the Venezuelan people. Um, but also, importantly, what it does is to look at the politics of those protests. And since January 23, none of the demands have been elections, none of the demands have been resolved the economic crisis, and all of them have again focused on this question of humanitarian aid. Again, allowing the international factor to be the deciding force in politics within Venezuela. None of them have focused or proposed anything concrete for how to deal with the situation in Venezuela, apart from essentially providing some kind of legitimacy or cover to the humanitarian aid that the US is supposedly wanting to bring in on February 23. 
Second point, in Venezuela there are numerous types of protests and most of them don't get reported in the media. Of course the ones that do get, pro uh, do get um, covered in the media are the large protests largely are the protests largely organized by the opposition political parties. They're protests that um, that have little to no economic demands, i.e. contradicting the idea that this is simply a population fed up by the economic crisis, and instead focused on on political issues, whether it be freeing political prisoners, whether it be previously for elections, and today now for foreign aid and in some cases open calls for foreign intervention. Thirdly, some of the, the, the number of the protests that are not covered at all and made invisible by the media are the pro-government or the Chavista protests that occur on and have been occurring on an almost daily basis as a, as a string of protests being organised in regional cities all across Venezuela. None of them ever get reported in the media. And thirdly, what almost never gets in, uh, record, uh, reported in the media are the range of protests that are occurring, or again, almost on a daily basis, or at least were occur occurring up until now because of the situation have been dampened down, which are what you could call non-political economic protests, comprised of people that are supportive of the government, supportive of the, of the opposition, supportive of neither side of politics but focused on specific demands, and many of which um, uh, and essentially wanting to find solutions to their everyday problems. None of these protests really get uh, covered in the media um, because they don't fit into the narrative that is explained uh, uh, previously of just simply an opposition movement against uh, a dictatorial government. But what about then the question of don't the majority oppose Maduro? Well, arguably that's true. And I say arguably, but uh, let's, if we accept the polling figures, and Venezuela is infamous for getting the polling figures wrong, but if we accept that this is true, well, the reality is this is absolutely true for 99% of the countries around the world. No head of state in the world today has more than 50% support. Uh, <laughs> certainly Scott Morrison doesn't. Certainly Emmanuel Macron in France doesn't. Certainly Trump in the United States don't. Mm. Anyone, if, 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 if our justification <laughs> for overthrowing a head of state is because the majority of the, <laughs> of the population don't support them, as I said, 99%. Yeah. I'm sure there are some countries that do, but they are the tiny, tiny, <laughs> my, my tiny, tiny minority. What is never really talked about is what do the polls actually show us? It, again, if we are to accept the validity of these polls, and I, I, I stress that, firstly, Venezuela is notorious for being having very incorrect polls. And secondly, when you look at Venezuelan polls, you must recall, this is true, not just the polls in Venezuela, but everywhere else, that what is almost always left out is the, the, the tendency of, for voter support in rural and regional areas, largely because polling companies don't worry there, and that has been historically the strongest base of support for Chavismo. So you can almost guarantee that any poll, you could add at least a couple of percentage points, if not more, to, to, the, to the support for Chavismo in Venezuela. But what do the polls show irrespective of that? Whichever poll you look at, somewhere between 20 to 30 percent of the population continue to support Nicolas Maduro and the United Socialist Party on Venezuela. It's not a majority, but it still remains to be the largest single political force in Venezuela. It's also a percentage that outstrips that of the combined opposition alliance called the Democratic Unity Roundtable and the support for the National Assembly, which generally fluctuates from slightly below 20 to 25 um, percent. <laughs> Even in the best case scenario, the polls indicate a 30-30-30 split. 30 for the government, 30 for the opposition, 30 who swing between those, both sides or, or, or reject both sides. It's hard to always interpret you know, how, you, how you declare those voters. Um, what the majority though do want, or firstly what they don't want, is foreign intervention and much less military intervention <laughs> into their country. And secondly, is for a negotiated solution out of this crisis as an acknowledgement of the highly polarised situation in that country. What about Maduro? Isn't he just a dictator? Isn't, is, you know, even if we're going to accept all, all of it that I've set up until now, how can we stand here and defend Nicolas Maduro? Well, I think there are certainly some undemocratic or questionable actions that have been undertaken during the Maduro gov um, government. Um, whether that be arrests of certain uh, political activists, whether that be the banning of certain political candidates, uh, the delaying of elections. Some of these uh, actions are very legitimate and can be very well explained. Others are highly questionable. Um, but there's no doubt that 
if we put them into the context of other countries in the region, they are far from being the worst scenarios in terms of, of, of any, of, if we look at any of these categories, and I, again, I defer to what I said to, to, in, into Brazil, where we've had political leaders arrested, where we've had candidates banned from running, where we've had um, presidents removed in unconstitutional coups, where we've had disenfranchisement of billions of voters in, all, in, in largely poor areas to ensure that the Workers' Party uh, couldn't get votes in there. And that's just one of many other countries that we could go through. But even if we, you know, I don't want to get into stuck into, oh, well, you know, this other country is worse, so then it's, it's all right. What the argument really always misses out is the context of what is occurring in Venezuela. And that is for the last 20 years, both sides have largely, when, it, when forced to, rejected the rules of the game. And that's because the opposition have refused to accept them from the start. It's from 1998, when Chávez was first elected, they declared that they would not accept the legitimacy of his, of his government. They organised a coup to try to overthrow him. They shut down the oil industry for two months to try to destroy the economy to overthrow him. They've carried out numerous actions and numerous assassination attempts and coups. In that context, to then criticise that, you know, someone got jailed, um, it, it sort of seems almost a, a bit of a joke and not an attempt to seriously analyse what's been happening in Venezuela for the last 20 years. It's also true to say that the opposition has always said that first Chavez and then Maduro was a dictatorship. But on any of the serious tests of what a dictatorship is, Venezuela does not fit in. When we look at the media, anyone can go to any newsstand in Venezuela or turn on any TV and radio and recognise that the overall majority of the media continues, to be, op continues to be oppositional media. When it comes to elections, again, elections continue to occur on a regular basis uh, in Venezuela and where political parties are able to participate. And it should not be forgotten that the May 20 elections came about precisely because of negotiations between the government and the opposition who came to an agreement to hold early elections. Elections were not meant to be held until the end of last year. But instead, at the end of 2017, in dialogues facilitated by former Spanish President Zapatero, the, both sides of politics got together and agreed that they would hold early elections. What happened? At the last moment, and as Zapatero said, under pressure from who knows where, the opposition refused to sign to that agreement. Maduro said, well, that doesn't matter. We will still go ahead with these elections anyway. And a couple of the opposition parties decided to abstain from those or boycott those elections, but others ran. And in all of the opposition parties that ran, accepted the validity of the results of the ballots cast and the result dictated by the National Electoral Court. Something that does not happen in, in so-called in dictatorships. And I think a final point that should be added to this question of dictatorship and what is occurring in Venezuela today is that it's absolutely clear that the opposition strategy prior to this coup attempt is exactly to implement a short-term dictatorship. That is a so-called transitional government that will decide all of the policies of what is to come, that will sign all the deals, and they're already in negotiations. And, and, and Richard, uh, Ricardo Hausmann, who was a former minister in the government prior to Chavez and has been leading the discussions about how to get Venezuela out of the economic crisis and has been in daily contact with Juan Guaido, has openly stated he's already in meetings with the IMF and the World Bank and the United States to sign loan agreements so that they can get out of the economic situation. Um, I'm happy to expand in question time what IMF loans and World Bank loans generally come, come associated with, but I'm kind of guessing that most people in the room kind of figure out what, what, what that means. Um, they want to do this, they want to jail, ban, whatever they can to wipe out the United Socialist Party of Venezuela so they cannot contest it. So by the time any actual so-called free and fair elections occurred, everything has been decided and the winner is already just going to be decided, uh, uh, simply a collection of candidates that are all favourable to the opposition. So what does this mean for us then if we want to try to help the situation in Venezuela? Um, the first point, the question raised, well, well but can we criticise or should we not criticise Maduro? Well, this is, to, again, to me, just seems like a... A, a pointless discussion. I mean, in Venezuela, even the most fervent supporters of Maduro are also equally the most critical uh, of Maduro. So if they can criticise, I don't see why we can't openly have a discussion about what's happening uh, in, in, in Venezuela. Um, at the same time, we don't need to fall into the silly trap set by those that are promoting the coup, um, that saying that, oh, you want to make sure you don't want to be seen to support Maduro. 
This is silly. This is the same argument that got used in the Iraq and the Afghan war. Oh, well, if you're not, if you're not with Bush, you must move the Taliban. At that time, it was very easy to say that we can easily oppose the, the war in Afghanistan without becoming comrades in arms with the Taliban. Um, these are very simple things, but there are traps that are constantly set up to avoid the real discussion. And the real discussion is to discuss the context of what's occurred in Venezuela and if anyone supports a real peaceful and progressive outcome. That means, firstly, recognising that there is a US coup underway and fighting as much as possible to stop that coup from being successful. And secondly, pushing to lift the sanctions that are on the verge of absolutely decimating and destroying the Venezuela economy, where no matter who is in government, it will be, take decades to come out of this situation. Mm. Um, isn't this just though simply helping Maduro? Again, to me, wrong question. What's the best way to help those fighting for a progressive outcome, the popular forces on the grassroots that have been fighting for the last, prior to Chavez and during Chavez and Maduro government to build a better society? Well, I can assure you that all of them agree, neither a US coup, neither US sanctions, nor elections held at the gunpoint, which is what the other outcome that the European Union is trying to, uh, uh, trying to push for, saying call elections now, in a context where the, where the US is threatening invasion, where the US is crippling the economy and calling that a so-called free and fair elections, none of these are going to provide a solution for those forces. Uh, instead, what we need to do, and I think is what is vital to do in the current situation, is continue to raise our voice, to reject the government's recognition of a coup government in Venezuela and to heavily criticise the Labor government for once again stepping in line um, with the coalition government on, on this question. I mean, when I say stepping in line, I literally mean if you read the government statement and you read the Labor Party statement, the last paragraph of both are literally cut and paste. They are word for word the <laughs> yeah. same uh, in order to avoid not making a single mistake where they could be criticised um. for deviating from the official line. We need to pressure them to change their position and to, rec to recognise what they are doing and the, the devastating precedent it would set for international politics by recognising a coup government in, in a foreign country. And we need to continue to pressure the Australian government to, to talk to Washington and say to lift the sanctions now. If anyone is serious about helping the Venezuelan people, the idea that $20 million or $50 million of humanitarian aid that the, that the, government, that the US government is currently amassing in Venezuela, and to give you an example of what that aid means, it's roughly three days of, uh, of what the, go the Venezuelan government does every day to fill food for the entire country through its food distribution program. So they think that one-off distribution is going to cover what essentially the, the Venezuelan government is doing on a free daily basis, um, is somehow going to solve the situation. It's clearly rubbish. It's clearly what, was, what, what is being used is just a propaganda attempt to further in increase the international pressure. We need to tell the Australian government, listen to what the Red Cross is saying. This is not humanitarian aid, this is political aid, aid that they stabilise in a country. Listen to the United Nations who do not want to touch this aid because they know that it's exactly the same aim of this aid. And instead, push to support those initiatives that are hoping to broker some kind of dialogue and peaceful outcome for Venezuela today. Because we can be certain that any situation that it results in a successful coup or some kind of military conflict in Venezuela would not just be devastating for Venezuela, but could trigger off much deeper um, uh, ramifications for the region at large. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. I'm, I'm sure I've gone over time. Um, but I Very hope good. That's all right. That's all right. Very Thank good. you. Thank you.